The Data Engineering Show is brought to you by Firebolt, the cloud data warehouse for low latency analytics. Get $200 credits and start your free trial at firebolt.io. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Data Engineering Show uh, for another awesome episode. We have Joseph Machado joining in today, uh, who did his master's at Columbia, then spent 10 years as a data engineer, data scientist in the industry. He's a senior data engineer at LinkedIn right now. And in parallel, he also has an awesome blog called Start Data Engineering uh, and is teaching data engineering to, I guess, aspiring data engineers. So good to have you on the show, Joe. So Thank you for having me. So like, where should we start, basically, right? There's, there's so much stuff to talk about here. Uh, yeah, maybe do you also want to kind of say a few sentences about yourself, uh, your background, exactly? Yeah, sure. Um, as you said, I went to Columbia here in New York City with the electrical engineering, although most of what I did was like network analysis, so like K-means clustering, that sort of thing. And then I started as a software engineer, but quickly got interested in the database side of things. So like automating indexes, making sure uh, people are writing good queries, things of that nature. So I was, I was in software engineering, moved into data engineering, but at that time my title was data scientist, but basically I was just doing data engineering, writing some SQL queries. And it was, this was back when this is Java, MapReduce and HDFS. So I started there and then slowly along with the industry moved with like Spark, Snowflake, Airflow. Um, yeah, I've seen a lot yes, of you've tools. You've been through it all. You've seen yeah. it all. No, <laughs> but it's amazing if you, if you follow each step, it started with implementing an algorithm. So like an expertise with an algorithm, right? Like K-means, you said K-means. Uh, that was the domain. And then it expanded into a micro process and then it became bigger and bigger and then moved into a data warehouse. And, that, and then you ended up with Snowflake. Um, but I think it kind of uh, tells a story uh, where, and then of course, I'm glad that the database always prevails, but that's a side story. Uh, the real story is that databases have grown way beyond anything that anyone predicted. And I think today, kind of, if, if we'll get uh, your share of the pie uh, and your experience around that and how you started there and ended uh, uh, utilizing data stacks, uh, I think that's kind of what I'm personally looking for in today. Yeah, I think that that's a good point. I think it started off... I it. it I started off with IBM DB2. I don't know if anyone here has worked with it. It was like back in the day, IBM uh, Voice data warp. warehouse. That stuff. was my first IBM yeah, product. It, honestly, it wasn't too bad. I mean, uh, we were the the main thing was the data was modeled properly, so it was very easy to use. I worked with data warehouses where data warehouse is great, the technology is great, but data isn't modeled, so it's hard to work with. But when I started off, luckily, the data was modeled very well. That made it super easy to work with. Uh, but I started off with like just writing Python scripts directly accessing DB2 and Hive. That's pretty much it. And orchestration scheduling <laughs> was just Python and uh, what was it? Windows task scheduler. And and it, it continues to work. I think it's been running for like eight years now. Yeah, it works. Just a second. Uh, Benjamin, for Benjamin and the rest of the young audience, uh, there were a lot of keywords. Uh, that most of you don't understand or know this were kind of uh, at the beginning, right? Uh, I love it. I've been there. But for Benjamin and the rest, <laughs> this is how it all started. Sorry, go ahead. I, I oh, no, love this has become context. a recurring segment I'm on trying, the podcast. I'm trying to tell Benjamin that databases and warehouses were not born in the cloud. Eldad explaining things to me before that happened before 2010 because I wasn't <laughs> alive back then. <laughs> uh, that's awesome well so I mean, having gone through that journey right it's like kind of from Hadoop MapReduce those types of things to now modern cloud data warehouses like what changed right that like, kind of like what's what's the same like when you look at the space today what are the main challenges you're seeing also in your job at LinkedIn yeah I think from like a conceptual standpoint the technology has gotten much better however the fundamentals still remain the same. Good software-driven practices, proper testing, that, that's still the same. And 
a lot of places, software engineering based concepts like testing, making sure you have proper CI CD setup, it's not really followed in the data team. So I feel like data engineering teams are kind of lagging, although that's changing these days, but um, that's one thing I've seen. The technology hasn't gotten so much better. It also makes it easy to build things quickly without following good practices, which leads to like long-term pain and having to migrate or do things like that. So technology is it's growing super fast, a lot of features, but fundamentals um, haven't changed much, in my opinion. This is actually something I'm curious about is, right, like when you're talking about testing. So when you started out, like this was, like, there wasn't like, big data engineering teams like at those companies back then, right? Like these were purely software engineering teams, probably kind of working with these big data technologies in many cases. So would you say already then kind of people didn't do enough testing on these big data things? Or would you actually say, well, so 10 years ago, we were in a better state kind of in terms of testing our data pipelines, kind of our infrastructure. Um, maybe because- Everything was consistent. It worked. DB2? transactions committed you know yeah I, I wouldn't say better or worse like it, it just depends on the team but it's a pattern i've seen like if you focus on fundamentals if your team has solid fundamentals and good data platform it helps a lot and 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 with the team size right like the data engineering team that you mentioned yes the there are a lot more data engineers now but i also feel like there's so much more complexity um in most cases unnecessary um, that adds to like the toil, the developer experience toil, if you will, of getting something into production. It's funny you're saying that because the tools should have gotten simpler, right? Like it's been kind of 10 years and like, okay, they are simpler in the sense that you can write something in like 10 lines of Snowflake SQL that would have been hundreds of lines kind of of like complex map reduced tasks back in the day. Uh, but this explosion of complexity to get things into production, uh, it's like, it's a bit crazy to me. Like, where do you think that's coming from? I have a hypothesis. I'm not <laughs> sure how accurate that is, but my hypothesis is that when the SaaS companies start building tools, they make it really hard to test locally. So if you have Postgres or something like that, you could easily test it locally. And uh, Snowflake, it's hard to test. Databrick, it's not simple to test. You can do it. And and one of the reasons why DBD is so popular, it makes testing super easy. Um, so with with a lot of new features, that there, 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 we were also giving up a lot of these core software principles, like having a virtual environment locally or Docker or whatever you want to run it, and, and being able to quickly run tests with data teams. It, that's a hard ask, but it is what it is. And then focusing fully on SQL. While SQL is great, sometimes it's hard to test um, specifically. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it has gotten worse or better i think it, it it has been messy and it will always be messy and uh, clearing up the mess is up to the individual team uh, but the technology has is far superior now i don't i don't have to like like as you said multiple lines of java code compile it and push it and i could just write a sql query and so yeah that's my that's what i've observed can you maybe take us through some of the challenges you're seeing today, like kind of in your job at LinkedIn or kind of other like industry exposure you had uh, around these uh, these types of things you're thinking about nowadays? Yeah, um, I won't say specifically about LinkedIn, but I could say it like as a general uh, kind of generalized idea. What I've seen is the developer experience is really lacking, especially in the d data space. Like I worked on software engineering teams where we can deploy in an R, if you put a PR, someone reviews it, that's it. But that's not always the case with data teams. Sometimes you spend like a month, you spend a certain amount of month, a week, a few days to actually validate your data. So I, I think in that aspect, the data teams... Don't be shy. A month is good. A month is, is a great, uh, really great. 30 days or 31 <laughs> days. 31 days, yeah. But uh, yeah, the, the developer experience, I wish it were better. And and it also partly comes from the whole. I feel like the domain itself, right? Like the from like a back end engineering or application development perspective, you have clear definitions, you have clear scope, you have clear, let's say, UI or a clear behavior. But from a data perspective, it's hard to quantify what right data is. So that that's the kind of difficulty that I'm seeing. 
Because if you quantify what write data is, what write data means to you, it should be pretty straightforward. But when the data grows in complexity and there are so many product teams that you have to coordinate with, defining what write data, it's in of itself a huge task. And it's it's never ending. That's like new edge cases and then you modify your code. What's your take on like data observability tools like Monte Carlo or something like that? Like where do you see their place? I think they do they do definitely help. Um, LinkedIn has its own system. Uh, we were using something like that at my previous place with DBT. Um, it, it, re- it definitely has its uh, place, but at, at, at the end of the day, it's just a tool. It cannot define what good data is. It can give you guidelines or so freshness, check for these qualities, sure. But it, the business rules, uh, for example, like variation of a threshold over time, well, how should it vary? What is the seasonal? It, it, it's hard to... D- automate that with a tool. Um, you need to kind of dig into the data to manually um, figure that out. Uh, but but those tools do make it easy to kind of set it up, if you will, super simple. That makes perfect sense. One thing you just mentioned is like internal tools, right? And I feel like, okay, if you're working in the big company, like also like as a software engineer, right? Like if you're going to Google, you're going to use a lot of their internal tech around how you deploy things kind of on Google data centers around like their internal version of GRPC, all of those things. If you go to Facebook, same thing, internal tools. If you go to Microsoft, same thing, right? It's like as a data engineer, I assume that's not so different. Like if you go to kind of big technology companies, which have like exabytes of data they're managing, there will be in-house tools for specific problems. Um, how do you think about that in terms of uh, like, staying then relevant and kind of up to date with technology, right? Because it seems like that actually makes it harder. And like, especially data engineering, I feel like it's even more about the tools you know how to use compared to software engineering, which is already about that. Uh, so what's what's your take on that? Like data engineering kind of at big tech then? I have like a opposing opinion to that. I don't think tools matter. I think the the principles matter, like test data before you publish it to your stakeholders. Um, how do you quantify test? Those sort of things matter. The the design principle, if you will. I don't think tools matter as much. For example, you could have Spark, you could have Snowflake. At the end of the day, they are both distributed systems. You, If you know how to look at distributed query plans, optimize it, you're good. That, that's my opinion. But I do know when you apply for jobs, you need to uh, tick certain boxes. Um, so the way I think about it is if I have experience in like, let's say Snowflake, I would just try out Spark on my own, see how it works. This is super interesting, you know, because in many ways, what you're saying is uh, uh, many steps within the data pipeline uh, 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 are commoditized. You can pick, you know, like each step, you have a choice of 10 tools. And uh, each one of them is unique on its own, et cetera, advantages, disadvantages. But by the end of the day, you look at the whole data pipe, the whole funnel, right? That's your product. Uh, kind of the input and eventual output, right? Uh, uh, you're talking uh, uh, unstructured data coming in, defining raw metadata on top of it. Like this is very delicate uh, stuff. Uh, completely owned, I think, dominated by the human factor, right? Of course, once it gets semi-structured and then, of course, structured, it's easy, right? Like, the universe becomes much easier. But I think in many ways, it's, it's really some of those big steps are mostly about efficiency, getting the job done. Um, how fast, right? How robust? Can you plug and play each part and, and, and have the human part own it? Interesting to get your opinion, especially where you're at, right? Where in-house dev happens, how you apply AI on those delicate parts of the process, right? Uh, is that applied? Is there ELT... Dot let's, AI let's start with being... one question, Elda. It's it's been a million yeah, yeah. questions. I one, can't keep track. Answer one of those. <laughs> each one of those is great. I mean, but yeah, I think as for AI, um, there is an internal tool to convert text to SQL queries. It's like the 
low hanging fruit pro- type product. I think everyone's doing it. Convert text to SQL queries based on the metadata information we have. Um, but for designs, we don't have we we do have like a template we one can use because at the end of the day, most pipelines are kind of similar. So there are templates we can use to kind of quickly spin something up. However, within those templates, we still have to write a Spark job. We still have to see how joins are done. We still have to figure out what is the best way to design that code, how to structure it, how to organize it. That has not been automated yet. So I guess that's why we have a job. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that I, I don't know if it will ever be automated because there are so many constraints, especially in a big company with so many teams, so many formats, so many data nuances. Um, which which I kind of brings me to another point, which is like the separation of product teams and data teams. I think it's pretty not great. It's bad, I think. It's because product team operates on its own, data team operates on its own. That way there's like a huge disconnect. So if if there were more kind of connection, like embedded data engineers within the product team, that might kind of enable a more AI driven development, but so far more people, more people. No, but- no more <laughs> No, I didn't try more people. I don't think it's always the solution is it's just <laughs> yeah. You know, it's uh no matter how you play speed, you know, like you can centralize, you can decentralize, you can uh you can do all sorts of uh, 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 uh um options and i think all of them work at, at for certain use cases at certain times for certain sizes uh if you have a good team um they can utilize any stack uh and deliver value and uh and yes yeah, so as you're saying data is becoming very boring and uh products don't matter anymore Uh, (laughs) it's just squeeze out more you know more efficiency more value no appreciation for the little things um i I, I do a great outlook (laughs) no no i i do think that eventually like backend engineers will become data engineers or vice versa as well like that would be my ideal scenario where like you have one team that builds the backend system and front end if you will and kind of owns the data as well. That way you don't have these two separate teams with two different roadmaps with two everything is separate. Like if it were in a single team, I, I only understand engineers. It. Amazing. <laughs> Not only engineers, but uh, I, I understand like a bigger team. Give you know, everyone an companies. engineer title, everyone, and everything will sort out. No matter how you structure you the teams. <laughs> Put them far away, right? Remote Benjamin. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. So, Joseph, one thing you're also actively doing is, right, kind of like uh, teaching and thinking about how to like teach data engineering. Like you have a really uh, successful kind of blog and newsletter called Start Data Engineering. Um, like, take us a bit through that journey, kind of like what, uh, how did you start that? What are you talking about there kind of now? What's top of your mind? Yeah. Um, so I started during COVID. I had like the extra commute time off. I was like, okay, what do I do with this commute time? This <laughs> is like such a consistent thing. Like I love it. Right? It's like kind of uh, for, for everyone we have on the show, we're like in kind of thought leadership and kind of education. Is always, how did you start? Oh, like during COVID, like we yeah. had so much spare time. Uh, everyone COVID remembers should... COVID as a very positive uh, memory experience. Exactly. <laughs> it taught me to data engineering thought leadership. Nice. I, I guess so. so. Sorry um, for interrupting. No, 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 <laughs> please. That's funny. Uh, no, yeah, I just started during uh, COVID. Uh, I try to write about what people are looking for, not what I like to write about. I would like to write about like more like low level operating system. Like, oh, is there a way we could use like system D for our, type, like more low level type stuff? But uh, that's not what people are looking for. People want like some projects or DBT explanation, things of that nature. I love this. Like, this is different because so far, always the answer has been, oh, just write about whatever you're passionate with. Start with something that no one cares about and you'll build an audience over time. This is the opposite. Pick what's popular, pick what gets the most likes, and then kind of commit commit to that. I love it. Yeah. I, I try to make it actionable. So always code, not just text. 
Um, I because that's what I prefer, as you said. I don't like just text. I, I, there is some sort of actionable. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. So if you had to build the perfect DBT benchmark, right? Like run the craziest stuff, the hardest stuff. What would be the kind of the hardest stuff to run on DBT? Have a global open benchmark, right? Just switch, plug and play, and run. How would you do that? What the queries would be there? Is there something going on there? Like, right, there's so many things you can solve with DBT. Uh, it is such a powerful abstraction. Um, tell us more, like what, what's out there? What's out there? Basically, I think everyone is just mostly doing the same. 90, 95% of the companies are doing the same using the DBT kind of project structure to build their own. I do think there is a need where there will be like a business vertical type product. So let's say advertising, right? I can see like someone building an advertising stack. So right from segment to data warehouse that you build it with DBT, you can deploy it to different advertising companies. Same with like finance stuff uh, from like pulling data from Experian or whatever it might be, getting some dashboards out to analysts. Because I feel like I've worked in multiple verticals, marketing and uh, advertisements, a uh, little bit of finance. So they all have the same sort of input. Like if you look at marketing, click stream, click orders, blah, blah, blah. Um, sales, it's it's the same thing. You Opportunities, thing, things of that nature. So if you model it right, and if you make that pipeline specific to a vertical, you can use DBD or and just deploy it to different people or different companies in the same vertical. It's at the end of the day, it's the same data they're collecting. It's just that everyone does their own implementation. So I think that uh, that we might see more of. So you know, they said the same about SQL. They said, "Oh, you just write it once, and you can run it everywhere on any database." <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and look, look where we are today. So, <laughs> what, yeah. what a mess. <laughs> I, but I guess SQL that is, the, is still very consistent. Yeah. If you play by the book, mm -hmm. uh, it plays well, really well. Yeah, yeah DBT this, uh, is same. Mm -hmm. It's very, really similar. Like hearing you out, you're really treating DBT as a standard. Super interesting to see where this grows as an ecosystem for verticals. Yeah, I, I do see that uh, DBT. You know, there's like a lot of community support as well. So if if they officially don't support a database. There's like community drivers to enable DBT to run on like different databases. So I, I do think a lot of companies are moving there, especially um, new new startups. LinkedIn is also starting with DBT. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite popular. Hopefully they get to profitability soon and don't change their license, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. <laughs> One one other thing you talked about recently in your blog post was open table formats, right? And I think mm -hmm. this kind of also uh, ties into uh, the kind of modern data landscape. So things like Apache Iceberg. Mm -hmm. What's your take on those? Like, where do they fit? Kind of, do you think they're basically eating the world? Uh, what What are your thoughts here? It depends on the company size. I do not think they're going to eat the world anytime soon. The, just because Snowflake has its own internal format, if you will. Um, I forget the name. It has its own thing, which is very similar kind of to Apache Iceberg. Um, Spark has its Delta Lake format. Iceberg, I think it'll be helpful for companies, bigger companies specifically working cross uh, cloud and cross system. So in at uh, LinkedIn, we use Apache Iceberg. I mean, we have a wrapper on top of it, but it's Apache Iceberg. We use it to Shift, uh, move data between our on-prem and cloud resources, and we can use Spark and our uh, Trino, whatever it may be. So at, at a bigger company, it makes a lot of sense because there are so many different stacks, but I do not see smaller companies using our, uh, Iceberg just because the the impact would not be as high. Like you could just get the same with Snowflake, and smaller companies are not usually not going to have like two or more data processing systems usually. So that that's my opinion on that. But I do I do think it's growing fast. There's a lot of interest, but mostly from bigger size companies. To me, I mean, one of the big questions there is, and we'll also have to see what the verdict is around performance. Right? Is like kind of one thing that vendors who have kind of first class 
uh, managed storage like Snowflake, for example, would claim is that they can build a file format and kind of like managed storage is going to be faster than Apache Iceberg over Parquet. Uh, of course, then kind of vendors who are into the open formats like kind of Databricks would disagree on that. And also Snowflake is now moving heavily in the Iceberg direction. Uh, so I think this will be like very interesting to see how it plays out over the next couple of years. Yeah, they just opened public preview, I think, two months ago or last month, something like that, for a iceberg interaction. Um, yeah, with Spark, it's super easy. I, I, I do think that like because it's open source, there will be a lot of adaptions specifically in like features parity, specifically from Snowflake and uh, Databricks side. So. Thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, it was really great having you, Joseph. Um, yeah, and see you around. The Data Engineering Show is brought to you by Firebolt, the cloud data warehouse for low latency analytics. Get $200 credits and start your free trial at firebolt.io.